In this episode, we speak with Ben Levin, co-founder and chief executive officer of Level Equity. Level Equity is a private investment firm focused on providing capital to rapidly growing software and technology-driven businesses. Level provides long-term capital across all transaction types in support of continued growth. The firm has raised $3 billion in committed capital, has backed over 100 companies since inception, and has offices in New York, San Francisco, and Greenwich. Level's operating team, collectively known as Next Level Operations, provides value-add strategies that allow it to develop world-class management teams, financial sophistication, M&A capabilities, and exit readiness for its portfolio companies. Ben has been an investor in rapidly growing private companies since 1997 and one of the first institutional investors in numerous category-defining software and technology businesses. Prior to co-founding Level, Ben spent over six years at Insight Partners, most recently as a managing director. I am your host, RJ Lumba. We hope you enjoy the show. If you like the episode, click to subscribe. RJ Lumba is the managing partner of GrowthCap and the executive chairman of Market Insight Media. He is the host of Growth Investor, a podcast featuring today's best investors, executives, and founders. In the minutes ahead, we'll uncover insights and strategies for accelerating growth and succeeding in business. Ben, really great to chat with you today. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. As I was saying, it's uh, flattering and exciting to be here. I've listened to a lot of what you've done, and uh, it's cool to see a business like yours in, in our sector. It's really, really exciting. Thank you. And and I've been familiar with uh, Level Equity for quite some time now. Actually, when in the early days of Growth Cap, when we were doing deals, we interacted with with Level, and I was always, you know, really impressed by how your team members spoke about you and and how you were building the firm. So maybe what we could do to, to kick off is hear a little bit about why you decided, you know, with your co-founders to start level. And, you know, we'll start at the early days of the founding. Yeah, maybe I'll give you two minutes of personal background because it leads in. So sure. functionally, I'm a native New Yorker. I was born in Manhattan. 1972, which means I'm 51, which sounds odd every time I, I say it. But uh, I came back to, you know, I grew up in, in, in rural Massachusetts where I moved when I was a little kid. And I came back to New York after college. I got a political science degree and I did a two year banking program. Still didn't know what I wanted to do. Applied to business school, didn't get in, took a little bit of time off and stumbled into private equity by being told if you had an analytical skill set, it was, you know, the buy side was better than the sell side. And so I got a quirky private equity job working for a family office doing like lower middle market industrial buyouts as a 25 year old. And for me, my whole life changed. I, I fell in love with the work. I became arguably obsessed with the work. And 26 years later, that, that's pretty, pretty much the same. So I did that for that family for, for about five years, my formative private equity experience. I joined then mid-size, now really large growth equity firm called Insight Partners in, in 2002. And then I left to found Level in 2009, as you said, with a, with a couple of colleagues. And we really had two, two goals. Like I love the job. I think I'm probably more so in hindsight, an entrepreneur at heart and wanted to you know, work with folks that I loved and create a culture and be able to control all aspects of it. And we wanted to focus on you know, what we now term the lower middle market of growth equity, which we'll, we'll talk a bunch about, but what I think of as classic growth equity. And so really those two things and, and coming up on almost 15 years since we founded the business, those two things drive really everything that we do. We're still super focused on the concept that you can build an awesome team that loves working together and and that can be a huge competitive advantage in lots of ways for attracting and retaining talent for our team, for attracting and hopefully investing in great, you know, bootstrapped founder-owned businesses and and helping those businesses grow. And then we're still super focused on that same market, you know, arguably the market that like TA invented 50 years ago, which is rapid growth, capital efficient, bootstrapped software businesses that you literally pick up a balance sheet and an income statement and you know why we like them. They got a great growing income statement without a lot of traditional institutional capital in them. So very, very similar focal areas 
today as when we founded it and and hopefully will persist for the future. You know, what I've found talking to uh, folks who've started their own firms is that it's so important to get the partnership right from the beginning and to set the foundation because that partnership and teamwork compounds over time. What was it that you saw in your partners and, and maybe vice versa, what they saw in you that gave you the confidence to say like, okay, this is the team and we're going to start. Yeah. I mean, there's like a huge amount of gray. It's like you have a, you have a natural kind of affinity for one another, a desire to interact like of the three original founders, like super different personalities. So we had the funny experience of we'd ask each other questions and we take a very different path to get to a similar answer, which we found was was really valuable. And so we were foils for one another. You have to have a shared risk tolerance, like starting a business, almost no matter when you do it, has a huge amount of risks. And I'm definitely risk averse in huge slices of my life and have anxieties about lots of things, but I didn't in this area and nor did they, and really liked the idea of, of building something and didn't have a an inflexible view of what that could be. Like we did achieve the actual goal, which was raising a first time fund, but had we had to do deals on a one-off basis for a period of time or pursue working together in this market in a different structure, that that was okay with us. So I think like alignment, shared flexibility, and then a genuine affection, personal and professional for one another, because you know, the most obvious thing in the world is you spend a shocking amount of time with the folks that you work with in any industry, and certainly this one, and you travel a lot with them. And so appreciating the small things, uh, I think it's a big deal. Yeah, I was just speaking to uh, another firm founder, and we talked about culture, you know, because it's, it, it's like the, the, the business is people, you know, that that's what drives the firm forward. Do you have a philosophy around how you like to hire and, and, and what you see in certain talent that makes you want to say like, okay, this is a person I want to work with for the long term? I'll make a couple of comments on culture. So I think there's two or three things that are super important from a cultural perspective. And again, I think they're super obvious. One is is literally like liking the people that you work with. And, you know, you can call it like the plane test. You want to sit next to somebody for six hours. And so that's one piece. I think a second piece is a significant amount of transparency, like people understanding you know, especially junior and mid-level people, like understanding what it is that they need to do to get to the next stage of their career and kind of what's valued and how things happen and why things happen. It's, I think, a super awkward situation to be in an organization where you don't understand how it works. It's it's very hard, I think, to feel good about a culture where you don't understand how things work. And then, you know, for aggressive, gregarious, young people, it's hard to create a culture when you don't have the potential, a great culture when you don't have the potential for, for growth. So I think growth is a, is a key ingredient. Like growth's intoxicating, it's infectious, people want to grow in their careers, they want to do more things. So having the ability for people to move forward. In terms of like how we hire, we do lots of the same things. I think, you know, lots of other private equity firms do. We go to great schools and we hire people that are, you know, probably much smarter than than most of us. But I think you look for for those attributes, like you look for people that are really curious. You look for people that have a positive, infectious attitude, are fun to be around, are fun to talk to, are engaging. And then you bring those people into a situation and a lot of those people figure out a way to be successful. Obviously, not everybody ends up early on in their career gravitating towards a sourcing job or towards private equity in general. But that's those are the things that, like when I interview someone, it's like a 95% cultural interview. I'm looking for people that like exploring, like figuring things out. It's a huge part of being an investor is being genuinely curious, being positive. Things that honestly, in, in my early career, took time to understand. But those are the things when you meet a young person. And I am pretty shocked when you meet kids now who are, you know, in their second and third year of college, you have a lot of those attributes. It's a kind of insane hiring environment versus where it was 10 or 20 years ago. And and how has your thinking evolved over the past 15 years in, in terms of you know, how you think about building your business? Or, or have there been changes in, in kind of your philosophy to building? I mean, from a from a business model and from a focal area perspective, not huge. We, you know, we we manage growth equity funds. We have an opportunistic business, and we have a structured capital, or what you would have called fifteen or twenty years ago, a mezzanine business. 
But the foundational thing that we do is we focus on, you know, this two to three percent of the now trillion dollars that chases private software businesses, which are, you know, sub 25, often sub 15, often sub 10, often, you know, bootstrapped, founder owned, we'll do minority. Um, that that is is really similar. And then culturally, I think we've probably I think we get better and better at sticking to the rules and living by the philosophies that I'm talking about, but I don't think the goals have changed at all. I think early on when you found a business, it's easy to you know, step out of a larger business and say, we're going to build an awesome culture, but cultures are organic. And so I really think it took five years, seven years, nine years for you have to, as a senior person, try and, and set a good example, but, but you're not really creating the culture. You're creating an environment where a culture can grow. So, um, and I think as investors, you, you get, you know, it's a pattern recognition, pattern recognition business. You get better at understanding what works and what doesn't. And you look back at emails you wrote or memos that you wrote when you were 25 or, or 30 and you cringe a little because you were, you know, not super accurate. But no, it's all pretty similar around that core. So it hasn't changed a ton and, I, and, I, and we don't want it to change a ton. Well, we have a lot of CEOs that, that listen in on the podcast. And, you know, it's interesting when, when they first start raising money or going to look for growth equity or, or venture capital, they're often, you know, unclear about what, why one firm is different than the other. What, what would be your kind of like succinct, like description of how you're, like which companies you're most applicable to? By and large, the box is founder-owned businesses that haven't raised traditional capital, where generically the founders of those businesses, whether they didn't want to or couldn't raise huge amounts of capital, have kept control of their destiny. And they've earned this luxury of choice, the choice to pick an investor or to pick credit versus equity, or honestly, to pick not interacting with the investment community. And a lot of them, when they founded their businesses, may have had a not perfect interaction. Like they might have wanted venture capital when they started the business, but they were in an end market or in a geography where it wasn't super sexy. And so they got a no. And so I think that those are the businesses that like we built our entire business around identifying, interacting with, supporting, investing in, and helping exit. That said, I think they make decisions for a bunch of reasons. And there's a lot of opacity in like how private equity firms work. So they're trying to figure out the thing. Like, what, what am I getting from a private equity firm? And like mathematically, you want a firm that does a minority deal to, you know, pro forma for the dilution if they're selling 10 or 25 or 30% of their business to make more on the percentage that they keep. So they, they, you want the capital and the help to, to literally enhance the percentage of the firm that you retain. And then I think more emotionally and relationship wise, these founders have had total control. They've had the ability to do what they want. And so entering into a partnership where someone's either a minority or a significant minority or a majority owner is a change in dynamic. And so I think they're trying to or should be trying to figure out like how we will act both functionally. What can we do to help? We've got a, a big operational value add group called Next Level Operations. But also what we're going to be like in good times. And good times are, are honestly generally pretty easy. Like in good times, you tend to have it, not always, but you tend to have a pretty good set of experiences when things go great. But how you act in and you know, when things get challenging in, in 2020 or currently when the markets are are more challenging, what you're going to be like as a board member, are you going to do the things that you say? Can you actually do the thing that they want, which is to make the part that they keep worth more than if they just kept it all themselves? So I think those are the areas where as we call businesses and go visit businesses and you know sometimes over a multi-year period have dialogues with entrepreneurs i think it's the thing they're trying to figure out and the best businesses as you obviously know have a huge amount of choice you know they have right. choice maybe because they don't need to raise capital and if they do need to raise capital if they think about it smartly and plan it they have lots of different equity and credit options and so they really can pick you know re re removing terms Terms obviously are super important and, you know, prices will offset some of the things that we're talking about. If someone's 3x the price to someone else, that other someone else can be amazing and the right fit, but it's a challenge. But within a, a kind of a normalized set of, of deal terms, it's like, yeah, who do you want as a partner for five years or seven years? And is that person going to be fun to work with? Are they going to be inspirational, aspirational? And are they going to help you make your business worth more and get you to a great outcome? Like those are the things I think that entrepreneurs really should or and or do care about. Yeah, you know, as I think about the landscape of uh, you know where you play, there's there's probably several, if not more than several, firms that you'd compete with, 
And sometimes the best way to highlight how you're different is is through an example. Is there like, you know, a company that you worked with that best showcases what it's like to partner with Level Equity? Yeah, you know, we've had a, you know, it's always, it's like talking about your children. You never want to highlight one. So it doesn't mean that all the other, we've had, you know, we made a hundred investments. We've had 50 exits. It's been an awesome ride in the last, you know, in the last 15 years. But I'll talk about a business called Planet DDS, where we transacted um, a couple of different times. We bought control of that business from a search fund. The founder, Eric Geisica, had had bought that business with his second search fund and grown a, a dental practice management business to kind of the first level of scale, like a double digit revenue business. And we bought a controlling interest about four years ago. And all the things we like to talk about, like that that business is a SaaS software business in dental practice management where there are some very large incumbents. And over four years, he did four acquisitions, one quite large, take private of a Canadian business, built an entire C-suite around Eric as the continuing CEO, dramatically enhanced their market position, has a legit claim that they are the leader in cloud-based dental practice management. And then we did a a 50-50 recap with Aqualine Capital Partners about a year ago. They've done two pieces of M&A since. Aqualine's been amazing to work with. It has a lot of payments expertise, which is increasingly really relevant. And that business has the real potential to be a market leader, which isn't always what happens in a small growth equity. Like Lots of great growth equity deals are you're the third player or the fourth player in a big market. So this is a cool example of relatively small business, done a lot of M&A, built a a really exciting management team in a big market, and at least feel like they could be the market leader. So a cool combination of things and emblematic of certainly all the things we want to do. Do we get to do that with every single company that we invest in? We do not. But it's been an amazing ride. And Eric's a great guy and really, really talented. So it's been one of those experiences. As I said, the good experiences tend to feel good, but this one's felt good for tons of reasons. And then in your operations team, what would you highlight there about how they help companies? So we actually spent a, a long time thinking about how to build a value add capability. And much of that thinking came in the first five years when we didn't have any money to build a operational value add capability. But what we've built internally, which we call next level operations, is a group of six going to seven, eight, 10 folks that tend to mirror the internal operations of the target company. So most of the folks in that group have worked at target companies. They've worked at software and technology companies and sales, marketing, customer success, finance, technology, operations. And it's a mutual affinity model. We don't charge anybody for it. Um, The companies get to use the resources when they want to and um, when they need. Uh, So we think we've eliminated some of the kind of inherent conflicts that come with some of those types of groups. But increasingly, you know, having a functional internal capability that can be a transitional resource if and until that target company ultimately hires a world-class leader in that area, which is really the goal. You know, we tend to think that most of the critical vertical functions within a software or technology business over the long term need to be core. So they need to have a world-class head to go to market or sales or operations. But in those transitional growth years from five to 10 to 15 to $20 million in revenues, having an internal capability to assess, to help inform direction, and ultimately inform those hires has been, and I think will continue to be super, super helpful. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed is that the maybe shifting of titles and maybe organizational structure, maybe it's just, it's more uh, on the surface, but you're now CEO and I've been seeing this happen. What, What prompted the decision to change like the titling? That's a good question. For me, I observed that a small number of private equity firms had traditional CEOs, and I think a private equity firm is like any other business and will run well like any other business. And I think loose affiliations of partners is harder for a decision-making tree. And so that was something that seven or eight years ago we started when you know George and I were co-CEOs, and then I transitioned into being full-time CEO as George transitioned down in activity. But it was informed by seeing other private equity firms, and I won't name them, but there are some very, very successful, some of the most successful firms, both private equity and in our market, had a traditional CEO structure. And observationally knowing folks that worked at those firms, as they described how decisions got made, 
I thought it was a super intuitive and efficient process versus um, more distributed. There are some world-class private equity firms that have four or seven equal partners and they like law firms, you know, make decisions by committee. So it's not a, a statement that that doesn't work. But from my perspective, it was always intuitive that like any other business, you should have a senior management team and have decisions flow in that in that fashion. Mm -hmm. And when you think five to 10 years out, I know that's sometimes a daunting thing to do. But when that's you think that far out, where do you see level? I'm better at 18 months and five years than 10 years. Yeah. 10 years ago, I was 41 and a lot of this seemed unimaginable. Honestly, we want to do the same things. I want to focus on the same two things. I want to build a culture where people want to work here. I want to build a culture where I love working. I want to create migration and upward mobility for all the partners. I want to create a business that ultimately will survive me and the other founders. Like I want to create a business that has an organizational structure where people can grow into senior roles. And, you know, I love doing this, but at some point I will age out of the ability to do this as effectively. And I want to create that capability. And then I want to do the same style of investing. Like we're obsessed with this, again, this slice of the, of the private equity landscape that focuses on these smaller businesses. And we can grow deliberately, predictably, slowly as we scale a team that can prosecute more transactions we've added the adjacency of opportunistic growth and structured growth. And maybe there are some other things around the, the center, but that's the goal as to, as opposed to becoming a, you know, a 10 or a 20 or a $30 billion asset manager that does a lot of different things. We want to stay focused on the core. We're heading into the final segment here before we uh, go into the final two questions. Can you tell us the best piece of advice you've ever received? I don't know if this is advice I ever received, but something that flows through my head very often in positive times and negative times is this too shall pass. As good as things are going, they will never stay that way. And as bad as things are going, they will never stay that way. And the adjacent comment is things are rarely as good as you think or as bad as you fear. So having an ability to moderate between the poles of how your brain works or the poles of experience is easier and easier as you get older and have a larger database of good and bad things that have come and gone. But it helps, I think, ground you in, in situations where you can get a little bit too believing your own hype and too egoed up based on how things are going. And similarly, if things feel daunting, it can get you through that type of time as well. Excellent. Okay. Final two questions. One is, can you tell us about a person who has had a profound influence on you? So I knew this question was coming. I thought about it a lot. I do not have a discreet answer. I will I will say emotionally, like my mother has been my rock. Literally five minutes before we started talking, my mom called me completely unaware that it was a Thursday and I might be at work, mostly unaware of what I do for a living. And just, it was, you know, so she's been a huge emotional rock. But conceptually over a long period of time, work and life have been a big journey for me. Like, I didn't start my 20s as a, a super happy person with a big plan. I didn't really know what I wanted. I had more of a negative bias in, in total candor than I did a positive bias. I was kind of searching for something that would make me happy and something that would make me feel like I'd achieved. And it took the, the, a large part of, part of my 30s and my 40s to observe what made me feel useful and productive. And, and I have arrived at a perspective that that feeling useful, productive, fulfilled is more of a goal than kind of an end target or happiness. And I have a phrase that I think I stole, but I don't remember where I heard it, that happiness is an occasional byproduct of being productive as opposed to an end goal, which I believe strongly. Doing hard things, doing good things, trying to be a better person. Like I talk a lot about trying to be a little bit better in every aspect every day because the process of getting better seems to be universally fulfilling. The achieving the thing that's at the end, whether it's selling a company or getting a new title or making money, I have always found to be a bit anticlimactic. So there's a lot of smart thinkers. I, I'm not like the most voracious reader, but I, I read a book by Eckhart Tolle 15 years ago called The Power of Now and a New Earth about managing your ego, which I think is a huge conceptual shift in my life. I read a book called Flow, The Theory of Optimal Experience, which had a huge impact on me, which talked about what actually made people feel fulfilled versus what they thought would. And there's a lot of podcasts out there now. There's a, there's a lot of places now where you can get inspirational and aspirational content. 
Um, and, I, and I'd finish with, I feel like there's positive learning and negative learning. And, and I go back and forth between which is more impactful. I think it's super important to see things that offend your sensitivities, situations, people, things that that inform what you don't want to be and seeing the opposite, which is people that inform what you do want to be, someone that's so much more evolved from an ego management or from a life perspective than you are and seeing someone that's so much less and placing yourself in that spectrum and shooting for the aspirational thing and running away from from the other thing. But I think negative learning, especially it's also very true as an investor, like doing bad deals is a horrible experience, but it's probably more informative in some ways than doing than doing a good deal. Like you learn a ton from making mistakes. Yeah, you mentioned Eckhart Tolle. The other books that are really good, I think, are um, Michael Singer, his work. I don't know if you're familiar with them, I'm but not. yeah, they're, they're they're great along those lines. But he, this guy, built like a massive software company, but really he was this person that lived out in the woods and just had a different view on life. Um, moving into the before I hop into the last question, I heard you were really into, and this is years ago. I heard you're really into fitness. Is that is that the case? It is the case. It is fitness has been one of a small number of pillars in my life. Uh, I've never been an awesome athlete. I wasn't a great child athlete or a high school athlete. I got into working out in high school and college. I literally, when I didn't get into business school, I took a year off between banking and private equity and was a personal trainer and competed as an amateur bodybuilder. Like I just wanted to see what I could do. And it's a huge component of my own self-management. Like Again, I've done triathlons and I've done jujitsu for six or seven years. And I, again, I'm not not claiming victory in any area. Like I'm not amazing at it, but um, I think it's the best free, high efficacy self improvement methodology that exists. Amazing for helping manage kind of mental health. So yeah, fitness has been a huge core focus for me. Unfortunately, I got fairly fit as a 23 year old, so I've never really been able to get back to where I was when I was young. Who, who who do you uh, favor in the Elon Musk versus Zuckerberg matchup? So I, out of the gates, I would have said, so I do jujitsu and, and I've seen um, Mark start to do jujitsu and I watched him compete and go into a jujitsu competition may sound like not a big deal. It's a pretty big deal. I've been doing it for a long time. I've never done it. So I give him a lot of credit. He did reasonably well and he's super bright, like his ability to acquire skills. If you've ever heard him speak Chinese, it's unbelievable. But then I saw there's a podcaster named Lex Friedman, who yeah. you may be familiar with, who I listened to, and he rolled with Mark and I watched it. And then I saw him roll with and talk about working with Elon just last week. And he said he was super strong and relative. So, you know, I think, listen, I weigh 47 pounds, 147 pounds, and it weights a big deal. And Mark's 155 and Elon's between 185 and 200. So unless they do like a catch weight fight, nine times out of 10, I'd give it to the heavier guy, especially if they have some time to train. If they get to a catch weight, like if they met at 175, I think, you know, I think it'd be close and I might give it to Mark. It's that was per- I'm obsessed with mixed martial arts. I watch a ton of it. And so all the greats are coming out and saying like George St. Pierre said he'd corner Elon and John Jones said he'd corner Mark. And so there's some, I talked about it internally at our standup because I didn't have anything fun to talk about, but I'm obsessed with it. And Dana keeps saying it's going to be the biggest fight, you know, in history from a from a revenue perspective, he thinks it'll be four times the size of McGreg- of the, the McGregor boxing fight. So I, I'm pretty intrigued by it. I, I can't lie. I, I think we just recorded your interview clip for either ESPN or, or UFC. Last question. Can you tell us about a charity cause or other endeavor that you spend a lot of time on? Yeah. So again, you prepared me for this and I don't have a good discreet answer. I obviously think especially as as folks have the capability that charitable giving is super rewarding, it's super important. And earlier in my adult life, I spent a bunch of time um, on the boards of a nonprofit. I really just didn't feel like I was great at it. I didn't feel like I was additive. I, you know, I've obviously done okay raising money professionally. I wasn't great at it in that context. But I think giving is, is important and, and I do that and will continue to do that. I spend a huge amount of time, and some of this is selfish, thinking about the concept of an kind of overcoming internal barriers. Like most people, many people enter life with lots of external barriers, who they are, where they're from, what they have access to. But a lot of people struggle with internal barriers and that could broadly be defined as mental health. It could be defined as self-limiting, self-limiting thought. Um, and I think it's a huge deal. It's been a huge focus for me, like a huge focus for me over a long period of time. 
you know, as I said, I wasn't super happy in my 20s. I've had anxiety on and off for big, big slices of my life. And so I've had the ability to get and use lots of different tools. I meditated for coming up on 10 years. I've worked with cognitive behavioral therapists. I've had a career coach for 22 years. Like I've had access to and spent a lot of time just me working on me so I could do the things that I wanted to, to do, to try and achieve the things that I wanted to do and stretch outside my comfort zone which again, I've always found really rewarding. Like the getting outside your comfort zone is always very stressful and anxiety producing, but tends to be the most rewarding. So I I like doing that. I like thinking about it. I like talking to other people. Uh, I love it when young people reach out and ask for career advice. I try hard to take as many of those calls as I can. I like talking to people that are founding businesses to have a shared experience. And over a long period of time, I can imagine spending more. And we've had the benefit of investing in some businesses that we've invested in a mental health business that's, you know, that provides wellness training. And so those things are a nice blending of interests. But long term, I think it's a huge focal area, the internal barrier management piece. And then last on my list literally was fitness. Like it's a huge core component. I think one of the coolest things about it is it's free and accessible to everybody. And if you think about lots of different things, it's like the first and easiest way to manage a lot of things. So there are areas where I spend a lot of time. And if and as I have more time outside of the day job, those are areas that that are really, really interesting to me. If When you're traveling and, and the days get pretty hectic, what's the one thing you will not you know, skip out on in terms of fitness? I almost never miss some version of a workout. As I've gotten older, I've gotten a lot better at being comfortable with it coming in a lot of different forms. Running is obviously the easiest because you can just go outside and go for a run. I will not lie. It is not my favorite activity. I do it to, you know, to, to stay lean and because it's easy. Um, but you can go for a long walk. I think a, a long walk's a great, I'm 51. I got some joint issues. So walking is not a terrible thing. And there's so much content now that's available that you can get an astonishingly hard 20 minute workout in your hotel room anywhere in the world that's free on YouTube or Instagram or a variety of other places. And then I think, you know, eating is much more important than the actual physical stimulus, not as positive. I mean, it has a real mental health benefit too, but I, the older I, and I, I learned how to eat when I was young and I was into fitness. And so I've been very focused on the way I eat for a long period of time. And I've actually gotten better and better at that as I've gotten older. And it has a huge impact. Like when I travel, I try to eat well, try not to drink a lot. Those things tend to to make the experience. And especially you don't get better at handling time zones as you age. And so the fitness and the, and the food piece and the nutrition piece can actually help a ton on the managing time zones and energy. Well, Ben, I, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time and for your candor. I I, I feel like we got the real... Ben, it, it, it was an authentic conversation. So I appreciate it. And I know our audience will find this very insightful. Well, right back at you. I'm super flattered that that you had me on. I think what you're doing is awesome. I think it's super cool in, in our in our market. It's, you know, again, 10, 15 years ago, you could just log onto a website and hear what people that are running firms that you want to learn about are doing. So thank you for doing it. Thank you for having me on. And, uh, and I hope it turns out great. Thanks, Ben. 